I'm JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima, Japan, and today I am talking with Elizabeth Muller from Be Here Asia, and this is Thursday, so we're going to call it Travel Thursday, um, but it is also a very special day in Japan, 3-3, March 3rd, which is Children's Day or Girls' Day, so it's so wonderful to have you on the show today, Elizabeth. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Now, we have to shout out to Andrew of An Design Kyoto, who put us in touch with each other. Thank you so much, Andrew. Um, he mentioned that you guys are sharing the same composting system. What is yes. that about? Oh, uh, so it is a felt bag. I think it's called Life Cycle Food, Life Food Cycle or something like that. And so uh, as, in an effort to be more sustainable, composting was something that we had adopted and the two of us were talking about how there's so many worms in the bag and in the so if you open the bag in the summertime you see the worms and then in the winter time you imagine like okay i need to keep this bag at a certain degree so that it'll continue to compost but i really don't want those worms in my house um so we were trying to think about different ways to no, keep the worms outside <laughs> composting is awesome and that's so wonderful to hear that even in tokyo you're able to find a way to compost i have visited the zero waste town of kamikatsu in tokushima i have visited san francisco now these are the two locations where they're doing 100 percent composting and they have reduced their waste by 30 percent immediately by composting in my own house when we started composting we also reduced by about 30 percent did you find that like a real reduction in waste? Huge, huge. It's been amazing, but the only problem is our compost bag is probably not big enough for all of the raw waste that we have. So we, you know, for the first couple of weeks, we were able to reduce our waste. And now we feel like ah, we just have this backlog and we don't know what we can do with it. So we have to figure out maybe in the summertime, it'll speed itself back up again. And then the pace with which we consume and the pace with which it gets broken down will even yeah. itself back out. I, I had a good um, tip from my brother, actually, who's living in Seattle. They also have uh, mandatory composting through Recology there. And he said, when you have too much for the bin at one time, you can put it in the freezer. Okay. And then when you have less, uh, you can put it out from the freezer and it doesn't mm. smell or anything. So that, that was mm. a really good tip. Now, because we mentioned Andrew, uh, I wanted to give your, your interview series you've been doing, podcasting out. Um, it's a great idea to interview other people who have great insights from around Japan. And you talked to Andrew about his Zen gardens. And then on your Instagram page, Zen Gardens are the perfect combination of art, nature, and philosophy, is the quote. Andrew knows so much about Zen Gardens and traditional garden design in Japan. It's wonderful. Yeah, he's amazing. I really enjoyed, I, I think for a lot of people, you know, being a foreigner in Japan and accessing it through one of the traditional arts is one of the fastest ways to you know capture the hearts and minds of the japanese and and to find your inroad uh, and andrew most certainly has done that and i love his connection to the different monks at the temples and how they're allowing him you know that special access and then he gets to share it out with everyone abroad and my sister works for an arts collective um, where individuals with special needs have studio space and for them, mobility is a huge issue. They wouldn't be able to get into a Zen garden. They need, you know, special chairs where like the cobblestone steps or different things like it just doesn't make it possible. But Andrew's tours make it totally possible. And so that was one of the surprising things from coronavirus is that, you know, having to transition to some of these like in-person experiences being online did open up the audience to people that we hadn't been uh, targeting previously. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so taking a step back, because we're talking about culture, uh, that is one of your your key points of the tours and travel that you like to promote is for the culturally curious, right? Yeah. Uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started with Be Here Asia. So I, my background is in market research, and I was working for Airbnb localizing our mission statement. And I was doing interviews in Europe, America, and East Asia. And so 
on my East Asian tour, I was in China and Japan and Korea. And when we visited Japan, I went to a lot of communities that were around 3,000 people or less. So these were areas that were going through depopulation, but had um, embraced Airbnb. And that had really uh, contracted our hypothesis because we thought that in the countryside, people were more like a stranger danger. Like I really don't want somebody I don't know in my home and that Airbnb would be more adopted in the cities. But that wasn't necessarily the case. Like there were really thriving rural communities that had adopted Airbnb. So we come and talk to them and they're just exposing me to like so much more, you know, the global narrative around depopulation is a very negative one. But when you speak to an individual who lives in these areas, they are full of vibrancy, they're full of pride, they're full of so much joy. And I just felt like I had so much to learn. So I personally was very culturally curious. And uh, when I was flying from Japan to Korea at the end of my time here, I, I just decided that, okay, I'm going to need more time in Japan. And so I quit my job and I told my boss that I was going to quit my job. And a few months later, I, I got a one week ticket to Japan. And when I arrived, I was uh, like a child because I didn't speak the language. And so I enrolled in language school first, actually. And I did about six months of language school, which got me to a very basic um, level of communication and, uh, and then was able to start the company after that. Uh, and that's how Be Here was born. And it's been a, a wild journey ever since. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, let's have a look at the website. It's a beautiful, very simple, but beautiful website. And you've got a link to your blog, um, link to services as well. Um, yeah. So it's just, I love this kind of website design. It's so simple and it has a beautiful pictures. Um, but bit of text and insights. And then you're very active doing a newsletter. Uh, it yeah. sounds like the subscriptions for your newsletter is one of your main things, right? Yeah, I really love the newsletter dialogue. I find that the one-on-one -on -one communication, like if, you know, I send out a message, it goes to somebody's inbox, and then we end up having a dialogue about it. And uh, it's the best way to stay in touch with individuals who have visited Japan previously, but also for folks who are still curious and want to come eventually. Uh, so I've, I've so enjoyed sharing the process in different locations via the newsletter. And I it also gives you a reason to be more diligent about exploring new places. And so it's gotten to take me, you know, I of the 47 prefectures of Japan, I've been to 42. So there's just like a few more that I need to, to visit. Um, and I don't count like a stopover as a visit. Like you have to go and, and stay for quite a long time and visit more than one town um, in order to be really checked off the list. But I wanted to- I, yeah. I agree hundred uh, percent. Just going somewhere for an hour and a photo and leaving, not good enough. That's not the kind of sustainable tourism we want to return, right? We want tourism for people who are devoted to spending time in the local area and engaging with local people and really experiencing the culture and the area. It's not just about a famous site. I think, yeah. I hope when tourism resumes, uh, we have more tourists who get that, right? Yeah, I do think that the definition around sustainable tourism is changing because, you know, the, the idea of preservation of culture, preservation of ecosystems, uh, and then the socioeconomic benefit that, you know, it doesn't exceed the, the over tourism factor. That's kind of at its base and what we've talked about in terms of sustainable tourism. But now I think we have another layer, you know, as we become more aware of our global crisis that uh, sustainable tourism also needs to look at its carbon footprint. And it needs to look at, you know, how it's how it's extracting resources from wherever we are. And so we're thinking, you know, like slowing down isn't a negative benefit. Like it allows you to spend more time in an area and you get to go deeper. And so we're hopefully starting to privilege that depth, um, which will make us all, make all of our trips more sustainable. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just being more mindful of our activities while on vacation that our, our responsibility to people and planet uh, does not stop 
uh, while we're traveling, right? Like we, we yeah. have to, I always, uh, when I talk to groups, I always say you have to accept sustainability as a model for your life 24 seven. It's not just something you do at work. It's not just something you do at certain times. Like you really have to keep looking for it and keep trying to find ways to apply it at all times. And then whatever you try to do in specific times, it'll be easier because you're already thinking about it a lot, right? Yeah, for sure. Definitely the systems change starts at the individual level. And that's what I've been learning just through this process of trying to decarbonize my lifestyle and decarbonize my trips. That's something that we can get into later, but it's taking a whole new level of literacy on my part. And I think that this is, you know, with every new technology, with every new development, like we have to develop our literacy around it. And so it's so easy to fall into the greenwashing trap. And I have like one very immediate example, but I was looking for energy alternatives. So, okay, I wanna use renewable energies for my home. Like what are the options that are out there? Googling online, I found one that said it was, you know, CO2 negative or neutral. I was like, perfect. So I, I, my husband and I, as a trial, we switched our energy provider. And then I was looking, I was like, well, you know what, like, I'm just curious, like how, what are the capacity? Like how much could they, if everybody decided they wanted to switch to it, what would it look like? And I found their portfolio of the types of energy that they're providing. And the majority is liquefied natural gas, which is still a fossil fuel. And it's not renewables. Um, and I was just really bummed because if I hadn't have delved like one level deeper, I wouldn't have found that. And so, you know, we're testing out the solution and, you know, potentially we'll find a better one. Um, yeah. But well, it does I can, take a little I can recommend, work. I can recommend she's in Dinka. Um, okay. I, I got uh, information about them through my Mizu. Now, my Mizu is doing great work around Japan. A lot of people really trust them. Uh, if you go to my Mizu's website and then you sign up to Shizendenka, which is natural energy uh, in Japanese, um, through my Mizu, then they get some credit as well. And that mm. helps fund my Mizu as well, which is nice. Um, but they, you can choose 100% renewable source or a different mix. Um, they're very transparent. Our That's bills cool. did go up. I think it was not this last winter or winter before. Uh, we had higher, much higher bills than usual. There was something similar to what was happening in Texas. Uh, demand. demand for energy was suddenly really, really high, but the fossil fuel prices didn't change so much. But because mm. there's less remote renewable energy, the if you had a hundred percent, you know, demand for renewables, your fees went up a lot more. So we're oh, trying wow. to do, you know, like you, we're trying to do the right thing. Um, I think they've they've kind of worked out the system now. It's not as much fluctuation, um, but you know, you have to kind of be aware that the system, the infrastructure is very biased for fossil fuels, right? So yeah. even making the right decisions, it's definitely something you should look into and think about and try to do if you can. Um, but like you said, you have to really do your research and get good recommendations. And we also have solar on the roof, but a lot of people who are renting apartments, they don't have that option, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're going to approach our, like, you know, we live in a huge building and so we're going to approach the owners and see like well what, what could this building benefit by getting solar on the roof like let's let's see if we could start that exploration yeah and even if it's not solar on the roof like you said you're composting uh, i talked to john walsh uh, who's based in tokyo helping people start urban gardens and growing your own food even in tokyo so uh green roofs growing your own food there's a lot of other more sustainable options for urban people as well now. Um, so there's so much great innovation, I think. Keep looking around and uh, find options. Now you are also, I was looking at your Instagram. Um, you have these beautiful woodblock prints oh, yeah. that you often share. Tell us about this. So one of the movements uh, that's very inspirational from inspirational for me is the Minge movement. And that's 
uh, a folk craft movement that came about. It was labeled really um, in like the 1920s. And uh, it was in response to industrialization. So, you know, Japan became like a super industrial country and you have all of these individuals in the countryside and they had been making these crafts. And so an art collector went out to try and bring attention to them. And what I think is fascinating about the Minge movement is they were trying to use their arts and crafts as a way to stabilize the lifestyle of individuals in the rural communities as you know everybody is flocking to the cities and when i was reflecting about it i was like oh my gosh we're using that same strategy today <laughs> like a hundred years later we're still trying to use the arts and the crafts of the rural communities to stabilize their lifestyles as you know we shift to being a more and more urban society so i don't know if we're the, the hundred years that it's lasting means it's working or maybe it's not working as well. But uh, anywho, so the, the Minge movement is beautiful. They spoke actually this uh, wall hanging behind me is also a Minge piece. Uh, and I go often to the exhibitions to be inspired by, you know, they revere an object for its daily use. And they don't necessarily, the, any artist that creates it, like it doesn't need to have a signature on it because, you know, they've refined their craft to such a point that uh, you know it it's beautiful and worthwhile regardless of who made it and I I love I love to engage with the pieces because they all feel very connected to the earth and to the place around them like they all feel like they really have a sense of place um, so as sustainability goes you know I feel like exploring the Minge crafts themselves are probably great examples of sustainability is meant to be used for a very long time, like generation after generation. Yeah, I think we're we're seeing hopefully more and more of this perception that we need to look back to move forward, um, that there's so many great uh, insights and knowledge and innovation from the past um, that we can reapply and bring it back into relevance, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, especially the native wisdom, you know, that we kind of like pushed aside or pushed outside of our, our cultural awareness, but like they've been developing that wisdom for thousands of years. And that's something that would be very beneficial for all of us today. Yeah. Well, you, you introduced some things about Ainu indigenous yeah. cultures. Um, yeah. Let's talk about Hokkaido because you have some great experiences there, right? Yeah. Hokkaido is an amazing island. I think when I first when I first entered my concept of imagination, it's, you know, very famous for its snow and for skiing and Niseko and, you know, people all over the world will come to Hokkaido. But when you go up and visit, um, you know, it's just like, it almost feels like the entire island is a national park and there's a million volcanoes and amazing hot springs. And this uh, one area has you know, that really dedicated itself to the preservation of the Ainu culture, one of the indigenous Japanese cultures that was forced north um, during the, well, over the years. Uh, and unfortunately, like they're, they've been working on campaigns to uh, save their language uh, and to save and preserve their way of life and also the nature that they worship. Um, and so by going up to Hokkaido and going on to the eastern side, you get to kind of engage with them a little bit. They have a really beautiful new uh, facility in Shirao, um, which is in between Hakodate and Lake Toya. And where I was is in the Akan National Park. And uh, that's an area uh, where they've been based for a really long time. But I think that the hardships that they faced, um, you know, being forced to work under the Japanese, uh, it's it's amazing what they've been able to do by advocating for themselves. Uh, and I hope that even more of the land gets turned over to them um, in the years to come. But it's you know a fight that they're they're working on now. Oh yeah, beautiful photos. <laughs> it's a great area. That uh, photo you guys just saw with the the stones is actually a it was an old mine. Um, and, you know, it had like all of this rich natural resources coming up. And so they've turned it into an area where you can go hiking. Um, and there's beware of bear signs everywhere. Um, it looks luckily, really stunning. This whole it is area. So stunning. Oh, yes. And so the area has these great um, natural hot springs. And so this is a community run hot spring that's literally right next to the lake. And so 
um, this lake will get super cold in the winter time and you can still go down and have like a really warm bath or there'll be swans swimming in front of you and uh, the community takes care of it. So you can choose to offer a donation, but it's not something that you have to necessarily pay to experience. And you said this is Lake Cushado, is it? Yeah, Cushado, mm. yeah. Yeah, beautiful. And then the this natural sulfur coming up, uh, yeah. this is part of the Akan National Park, is it? Yeah, and we did that in scooters. So there's some really great options uh, to scooter your way around. You can get electric bicycles. Ours are actually diesel, just to be clear. Um, but it was inspired by an electric bike tour that we had seen on a really popular Japanese television show called Juden Sosete Murai Masenka. Uh, and so I would really recommend um, either bicycling your way through the national parks because you can work your way between the different lakes and the different mountains um, or taking an electric scooter around because the distances aren't so great. So you can go and get yourself a little charge and then keep going. Um, but the, yeah, it's just so vast. It looks so beautiful. And like you said, scooters, you know, but scooters use a lot less gas than regular cars. So still a little oh, yeah. bit step in the right direction. Um, it would be great to see more electric scooters around. In the States now, you see like electric kick scooters, kind mm -hmm. of stand and scoot and electric ones. I haven't seen that in Japan yet, um, but electric sit down scooters like this would be great to see. There's a company that might make its way to Hiroshima soon called Loop and that they have the electric scooters, um, like the kickstand scooters that you see. And so you see folks riding around Tokyo on those. Um, so I'm sure that as as the company becomes more entrenched, it'll filter its way down. Um, Is that loop, the TerraCycle loop that's doing the reusable containers for shopping? I don't know. Um, we'd have I'll to have look to check in. Yeah, LL, yeah, yeah, I LL, talked. LL. I talked with the director um, of Loop, and it's launching in Tokyo now. Uh, yeah. It's quite an exciting idea to have reusable containers that you have for your products that you love. Um, yeah. So I'll I'll put the link below if anybody wants yeah. to watch that later. Yeah, really exciting. Uh, speaking speaking of cycling tours. Um, good chance to talk about your trip to the Noto Peninsula. The Noto Peninsula is amazing. I describe it as just like a feast for the senses. Uh, it has, you know, if you're moving through the Noto Peninsula, and we did it via bicycle, you have the ocean always on one side of you and the sun is glistening off the waves. And then on the other side of you, you have these homes that, you know, are so cohesive in their design. And this area is famous for having, historically for having both the seawater that the homes need to stand up against, and then also a lot of really heavy snow. So the tiles have, you know, a different heating process and are like very heavy on the top of these roofs. And they're black and they're often glistening, just like the sea is glistening. Uh, and there's amazing inns all around it. The photo you're seeing now is, um, Sakamoto, and they're the anti Amotenashi. Amotenashi is the Japanese form of hospitality, um, and they're the anti Amotenashi Inn. So you go, and they they mostly leave you to yourself. But they have an amazing lacquer bath that you can get into, and they feed you like the most amazing meals and beautiful vessels. Um, but they're very hands off, and they just you know they let you have your experience in their traditional inn. Uh, without so much interference from them. And, for yeah, for me, good. for me, that's, that is on omotenashi. That is, that is good service. You know, <laughs> um, there is a different reflections or different perceptions of what is omotenashi. Um, but definitely when you have too much service pushed on you that you might not want, that's the wrong kind. Um, mm -hmm. This is one of the famous photos from the Noto Peninsula. Just beautiful. What are we so, seeing? Yeah you're seeing a husband and wife rock. And so they're tied together uh, with a traditional Shinto um, straw wrap. And then you have the lightning bolts and uh, you'll see actually these, these rocks kind of all along the coastline of the, the peninsula. Uh, and they make for great stops. Um, yeah. Yeah. And you, it's you also have this, I love this photo of the wetsuits. So the abalone, 
Um, yes. Divers is quite a popular local industry, I guess, right? So you yes. see a lot so of- off of the coast of Wajima, there's a, so yeah, this is actually in on the map, if you were to look at Google Maps, this is called like the Ama, the, the abalone divers, this is the Ama Machi. And so this is where they traditionally live. And in the morning they might get out and do their, their fishing. And then in Wajima city, they have a morning market where they're selling the fish and you can purchase it. And then they'll have a, a hot um, grill that you could go and use to cook your fish right away and then have it um, as a snack. But off of the coast of Wajima are fishing grounds that, you know, the emperor has designated different fishing grounds uh, for these women and, uh, they can live there and then like come back into the mainland um, as needed. But the Ama are such a fascinating group because they have built sustainability into their practices. Like they've always been thinking about future generations and trying to preserve the fish stocks for them. So as technology developed or advanced, so like you have goggles, you have wetsuits, you have um, oxygen, like all of these things that gave humans an advantage over what they were searching for the Anna like restricted themselves okay we can only have one pair of goggles and they can only be used for this many hours and they must be shared between everyone and you know we should only use these wetsuits at these certain times and it was also that they wouldn't over harvest and you know when you hear their wisdom you're like gosh we have to adopt that to, to think about the technologies that we have that it doesn't have to be used to its optimum we can use it i know you've spoken with asby brown and um the great phrase from his book, like just enough. Like what is just enough that we need? Um, so that I'm not great to engage with. And there's so few traditional, or I should say typical businesses who seem to be thinking about the long-term future. And especially when we're talking about the fishing industry, um, the, the meat industry, <laughs> We, we know it's so damaging, um, but they really seem to be only focused on short-term profits and that's so unsustainable, but everybody's trying to make their profits before it's finished. Mm -hmm. And now we know that there's so many negative effects of, of course, depleting the fishing stock. The oceans are a huge carbon capture. Fish as well capture carbon whales are carbon capture. Um, so there's so much about the overfishing and taking more than you need um, that has huge devastating effects. It's not just about one fish maybe not being enough. It's much bigger than that. And I know you addressed this. You were talking about uh, sustainable seafood a yeah. bit on your I have, Instagram. I have so much more to learn about sustainable seafood. I'm so basically, uh, my daughter was born in June of last year, and it was the first time that I was able to imagine into the future in a very concrete way. Someday she's going to be my age, hopefully. And uh, the world that she was going to be living in is going to be very different than the world that I've grown up in. And that's just a fact for what, what we've done to the earth to date. And I felt a really strong sense of responsibility that her next you know so her first 30 years of life are going to be one way because of what we've done so far and her next 30 years of life like we have a chance to impact and then we have a chance to impact her children's way of life um and so that's where i started to dive more into like okay well what do i really need to do now um in order to help preserve a way of life for her in the future uh, and so uh, there's this really great thought experiment that shows how our sushi is going to be depleted or what we would normally eat on a sushi plate is going to go away in the future because of ocean acidification taking away you know shells of fish or their habitats moving north or their food source going away and so it's just crazy that you think by you know 2098 you know there's only going to be one piece of fish left on and it's going to be crab and even that's going to go away and so to put it in such concrete terms, it's like, okay, well, like, you know, this is tongue in cheek. I'm saying it as a joke, but like, what do we need to do to save the sushi? Um, and so, yeah, <laughs> got to work from there. Um, it's, but it's powerful. And it's, I think, you know, we all need these kind of metaphors to help us have a better grasp of, you know, like there's this, the latest report um, from the IPCC 
see about you know what are the impacts of climate change that we're seeing today and what are the dangers and um when you look at it the report is so dry you know you go through and it's just like paragraph after paragraph after paragraph and it's like very sobering information but i think emotionally it can be hard to connect with and so that's i think one of the things that this sushi metaphor allows us to do is just like oh i love the experience of eating sushi i love the experience of doing that with my friends and family i don't want that to go away you know like what can i do uh, i think yeah, that's so. a it's a really important thing right like to to connect it to connect these huge big overwhelming problems connect it to your reality what do you prioritize in your life and how can you make kind of concentrated efforts in different ways without killing yourself. Like you have to live, you have to eat, you know? So, but is there a way to have less impact by continuing to enjoy your life or continuing to have a successful business? Definitely. So yeah. let's just think about that a little bit, right? There's a really interesting entrepreneur named Zita Kalb. You might've heard of her. She runs the Fogel Island Inn. Um, and so when she was talking about, you know, so this was a traditionally uh, fishing oriented community and they weren't really connected to the outside world by news sources. This is when she was growing up, like they didn't even have necessarily electricity in all of their buildings. And then these deep sea trawlers showed up off the coast of their island. And so they were like, wait a minute, like what is this new thing that's come in? And it totally decimated their inland fisheries and the island had like a lot of trouble and so she's come back in and created this beautiful inn um where they used local wood and local craftsmen to create all the furniture and they're being supplied by the local fisheries and her main point which i felt was like really humbling was that you know we talk about sustainability but for a lot of people economic sustainability is the first layer of that and you can't ask them to Oh, stop fishing and it's like well if i stop fishing i can't eat you know so we have to find that nice balance of like you said like you know reducing impact but still allowing people to live um and so that was a, a good so like yeah we have to we have to find that that in between ground absolutely and there's so many issues about fairness and justice yeah. um i had a great conversation with ian urbina about his outlaw ocean book but also his international project to talk about the stories on our oceans about people and planet and profits and how we don't often hear these stories mm -hmm. but they affect us so much like some of the stories um, in making the fish meal, which is used in fish farms all over Asia, comes from fish from Africa. And it's overly fished and it's really damaging the local quality of life because they're losing their local fish, which they used to rely on as part of their local economy. Nice. They used to have tourism, which is now not coming because the fish factory is so pollutive. Um, so all of our issues are very global, yeah. but they're very connected to products we buy. So mm -hmm. consumers as well, by making better choices, we can have very positive effects. Um, but that was really interesting discussion and so many connections that I'd never thought about or we don't hear often enough, right? So yeah. learning, being having access to information is so important, but that's also kind of pressured um, by news organizations who have to get their funding from somewhere, right? So yeah. there's a lot of difficulty on many yeah. levels. Transparency is definitely, I think, the only way that we're going to be able to move forward because as consumers try to increase their literacy, they're going to be asking all these questions like, oh, oh how does that work? Or, oh, where does that come from? And um, we're going to need you know, either force transparency if people don't want to comply or just, you know, the willingness of people to share their information so that we can make a more informed decision. But that always brings me back to the question, whose responsibility is it? There's a lot of people um, like I'll tweet about this stuff and people will say, well, it's not my responsibility. That's up to the government to do that. And then, of course, I will comply, but I'm not going to pay more for a product that's more sustainable because the government should be doing that. 
Yeah, but it's also your responsibility. It's all of us. It's the consumers. It's the activists. It's the local communities. It's the business people. It's people who manage supply chain as well as policymakers. It really has to come from all of us at least a little bit, right? Oh, yeah. It's definitely a yes and. I'm taking a course that some of your listeners might be interested in. It's called Carbonite. And it's offered by Graham Hill, and he was he started an organization called Treehugger.com. You know, he's an environmentalist, and he's been in the game for a little bit of time. And their goal is to help you reduce your carbon footprint. Like it's a six-week course, and when you enter and when you leave, like you will have reduced your carbon footprint somewhat with your plan of like how to do it moving forward. And he has the exact same message. Like, you know, is it individual change or is it systems change? It's both. Is it individuals? Is it private sector? Is it government? Yes, all. You know, so I think we have to get to the the point where um, we don't need to delay action because you know, oh, you know, it's just me working. It's I'm not at the policy level yet, and if it's not at the policy level yet, it's not worth it. Like that's definitely the thought trap that I had gotten into. Like my time is only valuable if it's going to solve the entire problem, and it's like, oh no. Like you just need to get started because as you get started, you'll learn about how many more layers there are and how much depth there is and how much work it is. And you'll be able to find like more inroads and more pathways for ways to have an impact. But if you are sitting back, just observing and trying to find like the perfect way to apply your time and money, like that will never show itself. Um, So I think whatever way you enter into the sustainability exploration is the right way. You know, and it's just whatever way you take action right now Um, and maintain that open curiosity that, you know, the conversation is always going to be evolving, you know, so it used to be that like having your water bottle, like, okay, so I've got my water bottle and I'm not using the plastics, like that made me a more green conscious consumer, but what if I have my water bottle, but I'm still taking like six flights around the world a year? Like, is that making me a conscious consumer? Like maybe not. So um, yeah, we're, we're constantly learning about like, oh, okay, I didn't know that, but I have the opportunity to do better next time. And so we have to approach that with that, that frame of mind, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I've talked to so many wonderful entrepreneurs in the series like you um, who are owning their own responsibility and then moving forward and inspiring others and providing needed services and products which are not really typical right yet right um one other thing before we move from noto polincina i love uh-huh. this the ku kutaniyaki this yeah. beautiful plates that you discovered there so there's actually a really great um new facility a new like within the coronavirus timeframe and it's architecturally very stunning. And so you can go and learn about the history of Kutaniyaki and, you know, just the patterns. And this is a pattern that is ubiquitous around Japan, whether you're on the Noto Peninsula or you're at an izakaya in Hiroshima or, you know, wherever you are, you're going to probably drink a, from a sake cup that's Kutaniyaki or you're going to eat a pickle off of a little plate. And so it's really fun to go and dig into um, where do these patterns come from and their different meanings and how they were fired and glazed. And um, so by close to the airport out by Noto Peninsula, there's this um, Serabo and it's a, a great place to go check out. So I highly, highly recommend people make that a stop on their way. I love that. I love ceramics and pottery in Japan in general, um, but it's so wonderful and it just cheers up anything that you're eating. Uh, any little pickles or or side dish that you have to put on these tiny little plates. I love it. Gorgeous. It's Yeah, it's a, a feast for all of the senses, right? Eating in Japan, the smell is important. The way that it's presented is important. The taste is very important. And so, you know, they're engaging every sense um, throughout the, the dining experience. Yeah, I love that. Um, the quality of the presentation of the food. So much thought goes into how it's displayed, even on the plate, you know, like how the plate is, is presented and plate upon plate. And 
Um, I had a great discussion with Bern Schellhorn, who's a German uh, import to Japan for a long time. Um, but he's a shojin yori chef. And he talks about all the connections between how your flowers are displayed to how you make each dish, which takes hours and hours, right? So many insights I never would have appreciated otherwise, right? I have to say that growing up, so um, I think growing up in Japan, you are exposed to this standard of beauty so much that it becomes like somewhat innate in you because my husband does a lot of the cooking for us at home and the way that he plates a dish versus the way that I might plate a dish are very different. And the food that he lays down in front of me has been purposefully like laid down on the plate to look and like, he like is always kind of like maneuvering things around and um, yeah, it's a, it, it makes it even more nourishing, right? <laughs> like whatever you're having, because uh, there's so much thought put into it. Absolutely. Now, one interesting thing that you've been doing as well um, through coronavirus time is to offer walking tours kind of off the beaten track, but in Tokyo. And this is something that I always try to point out is when we're talking about over tourism, um, Kyoto, Kamakura, Tokyo, a lot of these places are overcrowded in certain areas. But usually you can find back streets, you can find lesser traveled areas, even within these very busy areas. And it looks like you've been doing that really successfully uh, using Google Maps, is it? Yeah, Google Maps is a great tool. <laughs> it can take you everywhere um, for all of the, the problems that Google might present to us in the world. But uh, yeah, that's been such a neat way to, to bring people through the city and to try and engage them with different areas and different, you know, just include them in parts of my life. So um, I visited, when I was pregnant, I visited a shrine that um, a lot of pregnant women go to to ask for a safe passage of birth. Um, and it was great to be able to invite people into that experience. And a lot of times when individuals come to Japan, they only have so much time and they, you know, don't necessarily get to stop at this bridge that's been here since the 19 somethings and you know represents the Vienna art deco movement like you don't always get to go into that level of depth every time you're walking through a neighborhood with somebody and um, so it was fun to be able to spend the time to just you know move my way through slowly and also highlight the seasons and the different like this is something that's coming up koino body um that'll be here so we're celebrating Hina Matsuri today, which is often celebrated for young girls. And then there's Kodomo no Hi, um, which will be a celebration for children, but also little boys. And that'll be in May. Um, but yeah, it's just, I, I also found through these tours, like different themes that I hadn't been aware of in the, in the different areas and different reasons to visit. And, you know, you're, you just start to walk and, and you're like, oh yeah, like, this is a great place to stop. And oh yeah, this is a great place to stop. So as much as this, these tours were for other people, they were also for me to rediscover places that I often visited, but were, hadn't, you know, wasn't looking at with fresh eyes. So it, it was a great, great reason to keep exploring. Yeah. Oh, and a lot, you know, like this is Rapongi. You wouldn't expect Rapongi to have greenery and parks, like if you know about Roppongi's nightlife. It is a big yeah. nightlife area. Another area you walk through is uh, Ginza, which I love the Ginza. Um, I Do they still do that where they close down the center of On the Saturdays or, or Sundays, um, yeah, oh, where the Walker's Paradise. One of the really cool things about Ginza is they have all of these old shrines. So, you know, if you think about it as an area where they had been producing rice and that they had built these shrines to protect the rice so that they would have a good harvest. And so you can go in. Elizabeth, it sounds like we might have lost you. I'm showing pictures from your Instagram of your Ginza walking tour. So the last time I visited Tokyo and went to Ginza on the weekend and the center of the street was blocked off and they had tables and chairs and 
uh, blocked off to traffic. So you could sit in the middle. There was a, no traffic going by. Ah, uh, there you are. are you yes. Back? Yeah. So that's, they still okay. do the Walker's Paradise in Ginza. Um, and what I had been saying was that Ginza in like between a lot of the huge buildings that have been built up behind them or between them, there exist all these old passageways from when the area was a nightlife district, the Yoshiwara Pleasure Quarters. And you can like, those pathways are so ingrained in civilization that even as the area continues to develop or, and grow up, um, they've maintained them. And so it's neat to feel such a, a small scale within an area that can feel so large, you know, like the Saks Fifth Avenue of Japan um, still has a lot of really quaint community feeling to it. That's really cool. Really interesting, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There's the one of my feelings about Japan is that you're rewarded for the amount of time that you're here, um, because you're const like you're constantly revisiting something and learning about it at a new level, you know. And so, the longer you're in Japan, the more the more depth that you'll get to. And this is Yanaka neighborhood. Yes, Yanaka is a wonderful area. It's on. Um, you know, it's kind of known as a temple district on the outskirts of Tokyo. And when Tokyo was bombed during World War II, this area was luckily um, not as negatively impacted. And so you still have some of the uh, wooden architecture. And so the size and scale of buildings are what you would have found earlier on. Yeah. <laughs> so fun. Cute little doggy. He's so sweet. Um, yeah. I carp pond. I love carp ponds. I just, you know, reflecting on what a so grateful that we get to live in such a beautiful place. Very grateful for that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there was one other interesting, and this was uh, to celebrate the birth of your child. This area, right? Yeah, Sui Tengu, and so this was to ask for a safe birth. And uh, one of the interesting things is that uh, just in the same way that the Zodiac, there's Zodiac calendar for years, they have Zodiac calendar for days. And so in Japan, there's this association that dogs give birth to many babies very easy, easily. And so um, you would go to the shrine on the day of the dog, like any day of the month that lines up with the Zodiac for dog. Um, so that you kind of get double the luck uh, to pray for a birth as easy as how a dog gives birth. And I found that to be very, very fascinating. But they're actually all around Japan. They have different, uh, like there are sui tengus all around Japan, but they have other ideas about like what connotates like an easy birth. And so for some people, it's the idea of how if you have a ladle and water like can flow easily out of a ladle. So they'll cut the bottom out of the ladle so that um, when you lift it up, the water just flows out. And then you would leave that at the shrine to ask for an easy birth, like the water flowing through the ladle. So each community around Japan has that, um, or, yeah, would have their own association with what does it mean to have an easy labor and what's their ritual and how do they, they you know, celebrate it. That is so interesting. And so even if anyone is visiting, anyone's listening out there, and I usually say avoid the big cities, but of course, you're going to fly into big cities. Um, and it is worth, why not, having a day on either end before you fly in or out and really discover some of these lesser known areas of the big cities. You don't need to crowd into Disneyland unless that's really your thing or crowd into any of the super famous temples in Kyoto. There's more than enough lesser famous temples, which are still really worth going to, right? Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where guides can often be really helpful because uh, everybody has their own lens through which they see the world. Like maybe they're a writer or maybe they are into glass or, you know, I mean, whatever it may be, if somebody can help connect you to your area of interest in the area that you're going to visit, then it enables you to not have to follow the, you know, well, here are the famous sites that I've been told that are meaningful and you get to make meaning for yourself. 
And that's what I feel like a lot of our jobs are, is to help people make meaning in their new location and via the connections to the people, places, and things that they're exposed to. Uh, and people don't necessarily know, they're, it's just an awareness issue. You know, I don't know what's available. And if I did, maybe I would make that choice. But what I'm presented with are these sets of options. And so that's what I choose from. And so that's the other opportunity that we have is to just enable people to be more aware of what their options are. Um, yeah. And you, you as local guides are able to connect them to local events, local people that they might never otherwise connect with. Uh, we're in Hiroshima, so we often have travelers who have been traveling in Japan for about two weeks. And quite often people say, oh God, this is the first time I've actually talked to someone who lives here. I, I'm really enjoying my travels through Japan, but I'm feeling a bit lonely. You know, so having having that access to a local guide who's going to connect you with people, who's going to talk to you as a local, I think that's so valuable. One of the events that you uh, highlighted, which I thought was great, and you ended up working with them for the maybe the Noto Noto tour. Yeah, but this is a nighttime cycle event in Tokyo. Yeah. It looks so fun. Brad and Chad are heroes of the sustainability movement. They always talk about people-powered motion, and they have been taking individuals on backstreet tours through Tokyo for years. And and you know they they focus on an area uh, called Sasazuka. Um, but you know they've because you're on a bicycle, you can explore like so so far and wide. And they are trying to just promote bicycle travel within the city and. Um, they are not only creating events like this, which, you know, when you travel in a larger group, you feel safer to be on your bicycle, but they're also working on the advocacy side of things to work with the local city to say, like, is this bike lane truly safe? You know, can we create some kind of barrier between the car and the person? Uh, they're, yeah, they're great. And that's a, like a great example where they're, engaging on all three levels of the individual private sector and government sector. So not only are they walking the walk and talk with, you know, they always have their reusable bags with them or they figured out how to help people stay cool without air conditioning in the summer. Um, and they're giving you a green alternative in terms of like, what are your options when you're coming to Japan? And then they're working with the local government to try and create even better options in the future. So yeah, they're a great company. That sounds awesome. I've reached out thanks to you and hopefully they'll be on the show sometime too. Oh, okay. great. Yeah. Um, there is one other travel amazing adventure that you had, which we haven't talked about yet. Uh, the Shikoku pilgrimage. Can you tell us about that? Just a yes, bit? definitely. So the Pilgrimage around Shikoku is an 88 temple circle, and it has four different stages that represent the four different stages of enlightenment. And uh, you're following in the steps of uh, the founder of esoteric Buddhism in Japan, Kobo Daishi, also known as Kukai in the afterlife. And so there's so many different ways that you can engage in that pilgrimage. You can go by foot, which can take over like a month and a half or two months. Uh, you can go in an organized group on a tour bus, you can go via bicycle, you can go via your own car. Uh, and at each temple, you know, they have this great little, like, little ritual of um, how you visit and what you pray for. And I did this early on in my time in Japan and I did it by myself. And I had been nervous that I was going to be isolated, you know, like, oh, you know, I'm going to be on my own this whole time. but because everybody's following the same path, you often see the same people at different temples. And so I felt like I was like in the best group of people. And I tell the story in my blog, but I was coming towards the end of the pilgrimage and it was my last day. And I was going to the same temples, like following this other couple and I had stopped for lunch. And so I didn't go immediately to the next temple. And when I pulled into, you know, the, the temple after lunch, the couple that I had seen was waiting for me. And they were so worried. They're like, where have you been? What happened? We thought you might've gotten in a car wreck. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I stopped for lunch. And they're like, oh, 
so I wish you had told us, <laughs> like we were waiting for you to make sure that you were safe. Um, so I, I loved the connections that I made with the people along that journey. But the other thing I will say is that in our world today, we are often like driving at a goal and like checking off a box. And when I first started the pilgrimage, I had set a goal for like, okay, how many temples am I going to visit in a day? And where is my stopping point? And that took me out of the moment of the pilgrimage so much because I was always trying to get to the next place, which is not what mindfulness is about. It's about being where you are at that exact moment. And so I think after like the second day when I was just like exhausted at the end of the pilgrimage, I said like, no more. I'm going to go at the, I'm just going to like flow like water and I'm going to go at the pace that I go. And when I end at the end of the day, it's going to be just fine because you don't necessarily need to make a reservation in advance. There's like a myriad of options of places that you could try and find to sleep and you will always be okay at the end of the day. And so when I switched my mindset from having to visit a certain number of temples to just getting where you got and enjoying that, it became a transformational experience and it's a great reminder for you know all of these experiences that we go and have are meant to be integrated into our life so that we can live that way day to day so sometimes i find myself you know getting overly fixated on my to-do list of what i need to do and um that's when i remember like oh no this is a pilgrimage moment we need to like stop with the to-do list and live where we are right now and and get off that treadmill I love that. I love that concept. And I think uh, I want to touch back on the interview podcast series that you've done as well. That connects me back to your talk with Justin Potts about sake yeah. and revitalizing rural communities. Now, you talked about depopulation, uh, rebuilding rural areas as one of the reasons you came back to Japan and started Be Here Asia. Um, so sake is also like a pilgrimage moment. Um, you don't have to drink to get drunk, but if you're in a beautiful place, try a little bit of sake. There's so many beautiful sakes around Japan in so many different areas, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I think as the craft, you know, like we have craft beer and there's just more attention being paid to like where places people are coming from and or where your products are coming from. And there's actually some great sake breweries that are transitioning to be um, neutral. So there's the Yoshida Sake Brewery in Ishikawa Prefecture and they've transitioned all of their energy because it is an energy intensive production process in terms of heating and cooling. Um, but I think it's through some of these industries, whether it's a ryokan or an onsen or, you know, a sake distillery that they have the wisdom to withstand the test of time. And so they're going to help us transition to the future. So we get to preserve this old culture um, and live in the future that we want to live in. That's beautiful. And one of the things uh, that came up from a sake toji recently at a seminar, sake seminar I was doing, uh, was about, it's all about the water. So it's all about the quality, the pristine water that you use. Um, I enjoy drinking sake if I can also drink the local water that they use to make that sake with it at the same time. To me, that's I love that experience because I'm always looking for clean water to refill my bottle. Um, so even if you're not drinking the sake, you're drinking the water that they use to make the sake. I think that's really cool. That's and really then cool. a lot of sake breweries are also really taking care of the wastewater before it goes back into the environment. So there's so many issues of sustainability really connected to sake. Uh, rice is one of the only products that we are self-sustaining in Japan. We don't import rice so much. We are making enough, right? Mm -hmm. um, so many products we have to import. Um, so it's so nice to see a focus on sustainability and sake as such a great local product, I think. Yeah, I love the water, the, the connection to water. And uh, it just makes me think even like the calligraphy artists, they talk about how the quality of water dictates the quality of their ink. Um, so yeah, the preservation, arts and preservation can go hand in hand. Of course, water is important also for tea. Yeah, and you yeah. talked with Ruth Lionberger about tea ceremony. Ruth lives tea ceremony. And Ruth helped me see that tea ceremony 
in the same way that meditation is not just when you sit down on a cushion, like tea ceremony is not just when you are in the tea room or actually engaging in it, but it's a, it's a real lens with which to view the world and to view your interactions in the world. And um, yeah, it was, it was amazing. There's one story if we have enough time to, to finish. Um, I can't take credit for this originally. My husband did it in a TED talk, but um, if you go to Kyoto, one of the most famous pavilions is the Golden Pavilion. And it was built by um, Yoshimitsu Ashikaga. And it was like the epitome of like wealth and progress. Like we have a golden pavilion. And then his grandson, two, you know, so a few years later, his grandson is also like very successful. They've been able to maintain, you know, the wealth and stability in the area. And he goes to build something and he builds what we call the silver, like, the silver temple, which is, you know, it has a dry stone garden and the temple itself isn't even silver. It's like a, a traditional wooden construction. Um, and his view is that, you know, we can't always be doing more or getting bigger. Like I'm not going to make the platinum pavilion, um, that he could still be having progress by taking a step back and actually under, so the grandson is, um, Yoshimasa and under him was the Muromachi period when tea ceremony like really thrived like the culture of the area just like flourished and you know as we're moving forward into these years ahead like that's kind of the spirit that we're hoping to embody that you know we don't always have to have more and better and bigger but by taking a step back we can let like what we have intrinsically flourish um, so yeah, that's our our meditation for the day. Like, how can how can we build the silver pavilion, not the gold pavilion? Yeah, I love that. I'm just reading, rereading. I think I read it years ago, but I'm rereading Alex Kerr's uh, Another Kyoto, and Amazing. he talks about the silver pavilion as a great design of creating expectation. Um, because of the walls and the walkway, and then you have the big reveal yeah. of the beautiful gardens, right? And and he also talks about how tea ceremony experts, they were so revolutionary in using more like earthen aware or a little bit rustic or wabi uh, yeah. rundown, right? As a heightened... I heightened way of presenting tea, you know? So there's so many intricacies of Japanese culture and experience, which I see you presenting in, in your tours and your guide and your talking. Um, we need more of it. Keep up the great work. Thank you. <laughs> well, we'll be excited for the borders to reopen and um, yeah, we'll do our best to, to return to travel at a way that is non-harming. But until then, yeah. uh, people people can sign up to your newsletter and get your insights, right? Yes, yes, please do. I love I love engaging in conversations one on one with folks via the newsletter, and it's the best way to continue to evolve the conversation. So wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth Muller from Be Here Asia, for joining today. That was a wonderful discussion, and hopefully gave us insights, but also inspiration. Uh, for travel and culture, culturally curious travel. I love it. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, everyone.